Welcome to the Odyssey podcast. This is Jean Cavellos, director of Odyssey. Odyssey is an intensive six-week workshop for writers of fantasy, science fiction, and horror whose work is approaching publication quality. Odyssey is held each summer on the campus of St. Anselm College in Manchester, New Hampshire. Adult writers from all over the world apply. Only 16 are admitted. Top authors, editors, and agents serve as guest lecturers. For more information, visit www.odysseyworkshop.org. Podcast number two is an excerpt from a lecture Jeff Vandermeer gave at Odyssey in the summer of 2006 on why fantasy is important. The text of this recording is copyright 2006 by Jeff Vandermeer. The sound recording is copyright 2007 by Odyssey Writing Workshops. Now, why is fantasy important? Well, it doesn't have to be important, but I think it's important right now because the world is a place that contains great beauty and horror. You can, you can argue that we exist in a world where we're more or less at kind of a baseline, but the fact of the matter is that the way the world is going right now, I think we do exist in extremes. And I think that fantasy allows us to more fully explore this idea. It gives us more tools. It allows for the exaggeration and grotesquerie that you need to kind of encompass that and come to a kind of truth. And then also the world has steadily, I think, through the use of technology, become more, not less, surreal. Uh, I'm sure many of you have had the experience of seeing someone on the street corner who appeared to be crazy because they were talking to themselves. I mean, this is the first time you see that. You know, it's just they have a you know, wireless phone. You know. Um, or, we, you know, we, we walk up to machines, insert a piece of plastic, and receive cash. I mean, you know, that's, that's an ordinary thing for us, but it's a rather strange thing if you just look at it from the outside. Um, we fly places, we watch advertisements for containers of uh, cleaning fluid talk to us and tell us stories, which is probably the, the worst debasement of surrealism <laughs> in the world. <laughs> so I think we're living in a fantasy world at this point, um, if you look at it carefully. And therefore, the idioms and ideas of fantasy can, can speak to us in a way sometimes that mimetic fiction can't. And I think the world has become more surreal because the use of technology has not been accompanied by a consistent or true growth on an intellectual or spiritual level. And therefore, we see many dysfunctional uses of technology or irrational uses of technology that only absurdism and imaginative fiction can really help us understand on a human level. And that's another way, I think, in which fantasy, science fiction, and horror can, can speak more truly on a psychological level. And it's also because fantasy fiction can be truer to a psychological reality than realistic fiction because it's not bound to replicate a consensus reality that does not, in fact, at this point exist. In addition, it allows more distance from the world as we know it, and therefore creates more effective opportunities for satire and parody. So these are all different ways that you can use fantasy that I think make it stand out, and again, I'm including science fiction and horror, from mimetic fiction. And I love mainstream realism, um, but there are certain things that it cannot really encompass. Um, now, now that I've said that, I should also say that I think that fiction is a continuum or spectrum defined most accurately by theme, not by genre. I mean, does it really matter, in a sense, um, whether a story about love or death or politics is set against a realistic or non-realistic backdrop? I mean, certainly in a sense. I mean, Animal Farm is effective because it provides a distancing effect through fantasy. But do you want to do you want to compare Animal Farm to another fantasy work or to something like Solzhenitsyn's work on the Gulag or something that's more realistic? The same thing with like a book like Ian M. Banks' Use of Weapons, which is considered space opera, but it's not really that effective to compare that to other space operas. It's more effective to compare it to a book like Slaughterhouse-Five, which is also about the effects of war. So the reason I say that is it's important that you try to link, you make linkages and connections that are not just in fantasy, but are outside of fantasy, because it's more relevant in many cases, and it'll give you more models to work from. Um, another great example, uh, as a book you should read too if you haven't, is uh, Bogokov's Fantastical, The Master and Margarita, in which the devil comes to visit Moscow. Uh, the book's a marvelous send-up of Soviet writers, uh, but it's also clearly a fantasy, 
and the fantasy enhances the satirical content, but the book is still more valuable to us linked to other critiques of bad systems than to other books about the devil. So the point I'm trying to make is if you're going to write fantasy, it's not enough to sit down and say, I'm going to write fantasy. You must instead approach the story or novel in the same way you would any piece of fiction, through character, through inspired writing, through story. You can certainly predispose yourself to writing fantasy by immersing yourself in fantasy books, by encouraging yourself to write down ideas that you might not have been willing to try before. But I still believe the basic approach is the same and the themes are the same. It's very important not to divorce, not to set yourself up in a kind of separate place for that reason. Um, a personal or autobiographical aspect is important to talk about. Um, every writer is a product, obviously, of his or her environment. And regardless of whether you write fantasy or realistic fiction, that environment, that personal and social environment shows up in your work. And uh, there's a quote, the, 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 the fact is the biographical information does make it into fantasy writing. And it's important that you, you try to access that, that you don't think that when you're writing, for example, heroic fantasy or some kind of you know, quest structure or something like that, that that means that you can't bring a lot of yourself into it. Um, you still have to invest your characters with part of yourself, part of what you observe around you, in addition to bringing your imagination to it. And of course, this can be deeply personal or merely descriptive. Um, in my case, like I may have mentioned last night, Ambergris, uh, my fantasy setting, is more or less a combination of uh, pieces of my childhood, of places that I visited. And sometimes it's quite superficial. And sometimes it's just mm -hmm. something that I observed. Uh, for example, in Drayden and Love, there's a uh, during festival, there's a scene in which there's a group of women who are wearing um, kind of the, or, 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 or have those uh, kind of wooden horse things attached to them, and they're like doing out of like a pantomime. And uh, that's more or less verbatim, except with a different description, uh, a trance dance that I saw in Bali that was just insanely bizarre. Um, so you can incorporate these things in a superficial way that's still useful to your, your fantasy as well. Um, <coughs> It is important to remember this because it is best to write both what you know or have experienced and what interests you. A lot of instructors will say you need to write in you know mainstream literary. You need to write what you what you know, what who you are, you know where you've been. Um, the best advice, of course, is to write what interests you. But you have to kind of combine those two. It's not either or. And the other thing I'm trying to say in a roundabout way is that you can find the fantastical in the real world and in the mundane if you look closely. And that has to do partly with being a good observer or watcher. And sometimes <coughs> it has to do with kind of setting yourself apart and kind of looking at things from the outside. And as a kind of corollary to this, to me, every setting of every piece of fiction ever written is fantastical in some way. Because it's impossible to truly replicate reality in a piece of fiction. I mean, you have a lot of instructors who try to get you to do that. And what they're really trying to do is get you to give a, a sense of reality, get the reader to suspend disbelief, to believe what it is you're, you're telling them, but you can't actually replicate reality. I mean, if we're truthful with ourselves, then we have to acknowledge that realistic fiction isn't that realistic. I mean, we don't talk in life like we do in fiction. You know, we don't, you know, if you go to a party and you were to, you know, uh, audio tape that conversation, and then you would look at somebody's rendition of a party, it's, you know, it's just simply not the same thing. Or even this room. You know, this room is replicated throughout this college, I'm sure, but this room is very unique in and of itself. And if you tried to sit down and just do a description of this room, you could spend 400 pages, literally. You could if you really, really were detailed, and you still wouldn't truly convey every, every nuance of this particular room. I mean, it's just, that's not what we do when we write fiction, although some people think that's what they're doing. And this is just important to remember because it speaks to how you accumulate advice and technique. World building kind of goes along with this. As I know you're aware, readers make certain assumptions about the real world that they do not make about fantastical worlds. A reader does not automatically buy into Ambergris in the same way that the, they would buy into a story set in Tallahassee. And as a result, fantasy writers have to potentially take greater care with their use of detail, or at least equal care. And I usually approach this the way I would as if I were uh, writing historical 
novels, basically. It's basically the same thing when you're writing a fantasy book, with a, especially with a secondary world setting. And um, I used by way of example a painter, Dali, who's kind of a cliche now, but if you look at his paintings, you know, they're extremely surreal, right? But if you look on the micro level, every detail is extremely realistic. The way that he gets to there, to that surreal point, is by extreme specific detail, for the most part. Now, world building is itself an endeavor that requires a tremendous amount of work and research. You can't simply throw different elements together haphazardly, or the reader will not suspend disbelief. Instead, the reader will throw the book across the room. At least that's what I do when I reach a point where I just can't tolerate it anymore. Um, however, this is not a this is not a consistent thing. Real life is not a consistent thing. Real cities are not consistent things. It's more of a mosaic effect. You see what pieces fit together plausibly, but they can't fit together too well because the real world doesn't do that either. But readers do tend to revolt if you don't give them some kind of anchor, some kind of consistency, whether it's consistent architectural descriptions, consistency in type of clothing, whatever, whatever detail it is you need. Noting, though, that there are many implausible places or pieces in our own world, like, for example, you might be in a third world country and you might see uh, agriculture that's on the level of somebody with a mule and a plow, but they're talking on a cell phone, right? <laughs> so it's difficult, but that's the kind of thing that you need to think about when you're world building, that there are these layers. And so I take great care to be precise and use specific detail for that reason with Ambergris. Um, and I think a writer of realistic fiction can get away with being slightly sloppy at times without destroying the integrity of the story because the reader is going to generously fill in the blanks and still believe what they're reading. So for my Abergus stories, for example, I've done an extensive study of Byzantine, Venetian, and London history and tried to plug in various elements from that research to enhance the reality of the city. The funniest thing is that the stuff I bring from my imagination is not often as strange as the stuff I find in those history books. And often I'll have readers come up to me and say, I love that bit you made up about the Visigoth, uh, about the, the, the tribe that made their cloaks out of field mouse pelts, uh, you know, or, or this you know, terrible event where somebody beheaded 15,000 people at one time, in, you know, which actually happened in Byzantium at one point. Or the, uh, my favorite is uh, there was a, there's a, in, the, in Byzantium, uh, they had this thing where uh, they would bring people in who were inventors at one point, and they would show off their inventions, and one guy invented a flying suit made of, uh, <laughs> made of uh, water flasks or whatever. Um, they were empty. He thought, well, I could float with this, you know. And uh, so the emperor said, okay, show me. And he uh, forced him to jump off the top of the, the uh, <laughs> Colosseum. But the, the point is that the world is a very strange, bizarre place, and that we often don't notice this strangeness, this fantastical element, even when it's right under our noses. Obviously, those are extreme examples, but the point is still the same. At the same time, of course, this creates a trap familiar to those who write historical fiction over reliance on detail, on description. You really have to internalize all of that stuff before you use it. And then uh, fantasy as metaphor. Fantasy can operate at the level of metaphor alone. A work can be fantastical in the sense of play it brings to description without any fantastical event occurring in the story. And that's why I feel a workshop on imaginative or fantasy fiction is helpful to so-called realistic writers as well, because it can make them more aware of the metaphorical implications of what they write, and therefore allow them more choices in how to play around with those implications. A great example for me is Mark Helprin's A Soldier of the Great War, which is a realistic novel about World War I, but the way that he describes things, the, the way that he writes is so ethereal and otherworldly that he might as well be writing a fantasy novel. And um, it's actually more effective than many fantasy novels. And I actually think there are many mainstream writers who retain the sense of fantasy's play and imagination um, by retaining metaphors that operate at the level of fantasy. And a lot of fantasy writers who have frittered away the possible power of their prose um, by not retaining this sensibility, not being able to bring it to bear. You see, um, a lot of fantasy writers who use a very invisible style, which is fine, but it is also kind of removing themselves from the possibilities of language um, because I think people are more accepting of that richer language in fantasy because they're already 
in that mode. The text of this recording is copyright 2006 by Jeff Vandermeer. The sound recording is copyright 2007 by Odyssey Writing Workshops.